So one, we're still talking about uh, Port Harcourt. If we look at inflation, the mystery index and poverty index, state by state, uh, sometimes as your office uh, uh, released them, Port Harcourt receives one of the highest uh, FAC allocation, month on month uh, federal allocations. But if you look at poverty rate, it's one of, also one of the uh, poorest. So if we're talking about Nigeria being called the, the poverty capital of the world, now also among the top 10 when it comes to some of the most miserable countries in the world. Put it side by side for us. Yeah, you see, that's the, that's the unfortunate thing. You see, Nigeria has a man, more of a management problem than a revenue problem. Here is a state that has the high, that had consistently one of the highest revenues in the country, but also has been poorly managed. So the result is what you see. And why is it poorly managed? Because there's so much conflict, so much misunderstanding, and so much violence. If you can take away the violence and misunderstanding, then you begin to get an optimal mix of resources. And that's, it's, it's, it's as easy as that. And if you look at the countries, the the least, the most miserable countries in the world. You have Iran, you have Nigeria, you have uh, Brazil, you have, most of them are conflict, uh, Venezuela. Most of them are conf have political conflict as well as economic management problems. Nigeria, luckily, just doesn't have too much of a political conflict problem, but has more of a management problem. And those are the things that uh, President Buhari is going to be looking at in this new term. Uh, because it has to really hunker down on the management problem so that we can get optimal results. There's no question about it. Total produ factor productivity in Nigeria is negative, and we need to lift that into the positive column as fast as possible. Yeah, we have a lot of things to do, but again, if you look at how uh, businesses are done, we'll talk about ease of business. Look at this very contentious feud between GT Bank and Innocent Motors, for example. This was purely a business transaction. They started behind closed doors. You are not there. I'm not sure, but I need to ask if you were there when those deals were, when they were meeting together and having handshake. Yes, I, I wasn't there, there do you, really. No, well. I so, wasn't. <laughs> you know, so no. you were not there. So millions of Nigerians were not there. But then it's now now blown open and it's looking really messy. Well, I think first and foremost, the the level of ignorance in Nigeria, financial ignorance, and uh, is quite amazing. Here is Inox, Inoxin, which is primarily an in, innocuous company in Nigeria. It has no, you know, and has, has a lawsuit judgment of about $9 billion. And uh, is virtually bringing down the activities of a $1 trillion naira or, you know, $2 trillion naira institution. So uh, we need to isolate this. And, you know, that's the, the danger of uh, social media in a highly ignorant environment. And they're just... Uh, trying to actually be a fly in the ointment. But luckily, the GT, um, GT customers are sophisticated, they are elitist, and they can, see, they can read between the lines. But it's just it's a, it's a nuisance that they, can have, they could have avoided. They could have done something not to allow it to come to this kind of situation because the reputation risk to GT is much, much higher than the value at risk for uh, innocuous innocent. Okay, so we have a bigger bank on our hands, Mr. Rawani. It's called Access Bank. Uh, yes. What's your reading of this uh, corporate wedlock and some of what's yes, on? Access. Please go ahead. Yes, Access Bank, Access Bank 4.0, I call it, because Access Bank 1.0 was uh, the management buyout. Access Bank 2.0 was the acquisition of uh, Credit Lyonnais, and Midas, and all the others. The Access Bank 3.0 was the big merger between Intercontinental and uh, Access Bank. And now 4.0 is a scheme of arrangements which has, which has seen them acquire Diamond Bank. They are essentially the, the fastest growing, and uh, when you take banks in terms of momentum, in terms of customer acquisition, in terms of technology, and in terms of footprints. I, I must say that it, when, we're, when we're doing the work for the uh, Presidential Trust Force on Minimum Wage, the Access Bank was the only bank that we approached to, uh, to fund the activities of the, uh, of the, of the technical committee, and they graciously did it in, in two minutes they were afforded and they covered all our professional costs and all of that. So I must use this opportunity to thank Access Bank for turning up to becoming a real Nigerian bank at the time of a very important assignment. Having said that, the, the integration issues will continue to be there. Uh, they would have to work, work through that. But if any bank can actually work through integration, it has to be Access Bank. They have a history and they have the pedigree and they have the, the rootlessness of thought to be able to carry it out efficiently. Mm. 
Okay, so, so what do you expect to see? Do you, this is a much bigger bank, but do you think it will be much better in terms of profitability and uh, other ratios? Well, it takes time. It takes time to unlock the potential of a merger. And so you have banks that have organic growth strategy and you have those who have acquisitive bank strategies. This is a big acquisition and it's going to take time. So nobody should expect any, you know, it's not a magic wand. There's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of mental work to be done. And if anybody can do it, it's, it has to be this team because they're used to it and they have, the, they have it in their DNA and their pedigree is right for this. And, uh, you know, they just have the rootlessness of thought to be able to, 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 be able to execute it. And uh, having said that, well, let us look at another bank which results came out uh, in the last few days, which is Unity Bank. Uh, it's, that's a very interesting uh, institution as well. Here is an institution that its total footing went up by over, over 40% uh, to about $258 billion after you know, shedding some weight last year. But more important is that its operating expenses came down by... 17%, staff costs down by 8%. But if you look at their business model, they are, they are penetrating quite aggressively in the technology space. The POS terminals, the ATMs, their customer acquisition, they acquired over 800,000 customers in one year. And their agri products, the commodity base is so, I mean, it's, it's amazing that in spite of all of the uh, headwinds they were facing, uh, in terms of capital restructuring and all of that, they were able to have, you know, penetrate and make a mark as a standalone institution who has made, who has done demographically and regionally uh, made a massive impact in the northern part of Nigeria and also in Lagos. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting. Yesterday the stock went up by 9% and we expect to see it rally some more because of its, standal, its ability to run on its own in spite of its capital overhang. Uh, Mr. Lawana, you think Unity Bank still has a lot more uh, firepower to reload and keep firing based on, on what you know uh, on the ground uh, and, and what is in the news and what is in your analyst box? Yes, uh, we are optimistic about Unity Bank. There are, there's some work to be done, a lot of work to be done, really. But the current management are on top of their game. They've done, they've, they've, basically they've stayed focused on the technology space, they've stayed focused on demography, they've stayed focused on their regional focus, uh, regional approach. And if you read the Unity Bank Digest, which comes out uh, uh, twice a month, you will see that they are, they are, they are very appealing uh, on the social scene and also to a wide segment of clients uh, across the country. Uh, they've relocated their headquarters to Lagos, and quite frankly, if you take the demography of their management and the demography, the, the demography of their clients, they are forced to be reckoned with. As soon as they sort out the capital, uh, pro, capital issues they have, it's a, it's a bank to watch uh, in, the, in the near term. Uh, Mr. Rwane, uh, finally, uh, uh, give us a few insights into the job, uh, the work you just completed, the report you represented your team in submitting to Mr. President on new minimum wage. Um, what are some of the findings uh, that your committee uh, saw uh, in terms of how do we, f how we fund this new minimum wage? Well, uh, that's an embargo topic at this point because what happens when you, have a, when you submit your report, it goes, to, it goes, there's a council paper, then there's a white paper and all of that. But I can tell you what, the, the methodology that was adopted was quite rigorous and robust. And uh, what, we, what we did was to validate what the fiscal gap created by a minimum wage increase. And you know that when you increase wages without increasing productivity, that's a recipe for you know, an inflationary, inflationary spiral. So we, we had to come up with what fiscal steps would be taken. One, to optimize revenue. Two, to increase revenue. And three, to, to structurally adjust the economy so that it can, it can withstand whatever fiscal shocks that will happen. But also we went further to to simulate models which show that if oil prices were to reduce and production was to be disrupted, Nigeria would still be fiscally responsible. So when you look at it in all, we were very happy. The, the team was a fantastic team. We had people from the central bank, the DMO. We had people from the Ministry of, for Planning and Budget. It was very, very well 
and you know, professionally articulated. Uh, the president has his work cut out for him, and I think that the fiscal situation, which is quite uh, challenging, and the adjustments that have been recommended, if we take it and do it in a timely manner, uh, we are optimistic that Nigeria will not only come out of this as a fiscally stimulated economy, but also will reduce its requirement to rely uh, on monetary policy to solve fiscal problems, which, which is one of the big issues we face. We have fiscal problems and we use monetary policy to resolve fiscal problems, and that is never done anywhere in the world. Thank you, Mr. Lawani. We thank you for your time today. Bismarck Lawani, CEO at Financial Derivatives Company. We'll take a break, everyone. We're back in two.